After winning the Big Ten opener, the Nittany Lions now get ready for the 155th different opponent in Penn State history. What a difference two weeks makes. After the stink at the link versus Temple, the Lions have made significant progress and seem poised to go on a winning streak. Penn State's 2-1 and one after their first three games. They're going to wax San Diego State on Saturday. I have no doubt about that. They'll be 3-1. and one. Blue-white tailgate is next. Welcome everyone to the Blue White Tailgate. Great to have you with us. Steve Jones, Trey Bauer, Todd Sadowski. Great to have the gang on board here. We get into Frankly Speaking, presented by the Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. And Frankly Speaking happens to be you, the crowd at Beaver Stadium. Unbelievable on Saturday night. So let's get to the impressions of James Franklin and improving this football team from week to week. I, I'm just excited that, that we're getting better. And that, that's what it's all about. It's about getting better every single day. It's about getting better every single week. And I've seen signs of that. Um, you know, I, I, we got a lot of things we can still clean up. I no question about that. But, Todd, at the same time, we're watching improvement every week from this football team. Yeah, and I like the fact that, look, Rutgers was missing their head coach. They were missing some key top-notch talent. But there was no mini scare like against Buffalo. Penn State put them down early, and they kept them there. And, boy, that offensive line, we're going to talk a lot about those guys. But it was nice to see them control the line of scrimmage. Yeah, let's take a look at the numbers in terms of the running attack for the Nittany Lions. And, Trey, when you're playing defense against a team that puts together these kind of numbers, how tough is it for you mentally to take that on? Well, I mean, I, I think it's they had a lot of adversity coming into the game with Flood being suspended, um, having an interim head coach, all those other guys suspended. And the fact is, you know, they just got it taken to them. And, and for them, they couldn't even react because they were just getting run over. Every single week we get more and more requests, more update desk, more update desk. Can we blame you? Andrew Callista is sitting there. Thanks, guys. Just one important update to get to the fans at home. Starting in 2016, Big Ten teams will have to play at least one Power Five conference team every year, with some exceptions, and those exceptions are UConn, Cincinnati, BYU, Army, and yes, Trey's favorite team, Notre Dame. It is a fluid situation, so more teams could be added to that list. These teams could also be taking off that list. Should be noted that most of these teams already do populate Big Ten schedules. Your Health South Injury Update Board. I'm happy to say that the Blue White Tailgate Show was right on the last two weeks. I expect to be right on again. Andrew Nelson, doubtful, same as before. I'm going to say highly doubtful, and we may see him around the Indiana game, possibly Ohio State, if at all this season. Penn Staters in the NFL this week. Sean Lee had a monster of a game. 14 tackles and a crushing INT. How about that, Eagles fans? Allen Robinson, six catches for 155 yards and two touchdowns. Also, Nate Stupar got his first NFL career start with the Falcons and recorded seven tackles. The fireworks were all the rage last week as the team entered the field, and the fans want more. Problem is, according to someone close to the situation, College Township has an ordinance against the use of fireworks. There was a plan for more last week, but obviously that didn't happen. And Trey, this one is specifically for you since you're a Jersey boy. Bruce Springsteen's 66th birthday this week, his first hit single, Born to Run. It's almost like it was meant to be with Penn State's running game coming alive. And that is your Blue White Tailgate update. The update desk obviously writes its own publicity material as well. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it. Uh, what about some carryover, guys, from uh, this game to San Diego State? What kind of mo are we watching here right now, Trey? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's important to just kind of define, like, where they were. I mean, at the end of the Temple game, we thought that Penn State was never going to win a game this year. You know, they kind of laid an egg in the first half of Buffalo. They came back, played strong in the second half. They, had, they have three consecutive halves in a row. They're really good. Um, and I'm really I'm excited for them going forward. Well, for the momentum for a season, you like to break it up into small pieces, right? Sure. We're at the quarter pole here. First three right. games, they're two and one. 
And then you look at the next three very winnable games at home. So you might be able to hit the halfway mark at five and one as you get into the meat of the Big Ten schedule. But it's confidence. I mentioned the offensive line confidence in that offensive line is sky high, not just that group but also for Christian Hackenberg, also for the running backs, also for the defense. I mean, it just permeates throughout the whole team when you can run the ball like that. Trey, San Diego State a test in your mind? No, no, they're not. I, I think San Diego State, I think they're going to get blown out. I would be shocked if Penn State doesn't win by like 35 nothing or something like that. I really don't. Well, Grant Haley, of course, on the field is not going to take that approach. He says San Diego State brings a lot to the table that any defense has to be concerned about. I think they do a great job um, with their offense. They've had a good amount of success this year. And, um, you know, we're really uh, looking forward to, you know, playing them. Uh, I know this is the first time Penn State will play San Diego State. So it will be a good atmosphere for us and for them. And I'm excited, you know, that we get the opportunity to play in front of our fans again. They beat University of San Diego in the first game, an FCS team. Then Cal beat them 35-7, to guys. And last week they lost to South Alabama in overtime, 34-27. to One thing they do have, though, that they bring to the table, your running game always travels. They have that, Todd. They have it. Well, and I just want to see Trey go and speak to the Nittany Lions. I hope when Coach Franklin calls him in <laughs> before this game to say, guys, you're going to win it. 35 to nothing, yeah. game over. No, of course, you got to prepare for the team. And you got to get the stuff done. And as you mentioned, Steve, the running game does travel. What I look to now is this is what Coach Franklin alludes to in the staff about competition, right? These are the kind of games guys want to get on the field. They want to play. And San Diego State is the kind of team that you should take care of. But it's the competition part of it that's breeding in that team right now. They want to get on the field and they want to play against teams like the Aztecs. Well, coming up, the Penn State offense rang up impressive numbers. The offensive line in conjunction with Saquon Barkley and Akeel Lynch. A big night. Four drives of 70 yards or better. They beat Rutgers 28 to 3. We'll talk about the Nittany Lion offense as we continue with the Blue White Tailgate Show presented by Coors White. plays what did all three have in common they were all running plays Penn State's been known for running the football for a long time guys now in the modern era of football guess what Penn State this year running the football Trey yeah I mean it, it's you know we talked about this from the beginning of the season what was going to happen with the offensive line they obviously didn't play well against Temple you know they really starting to turn it on now uh, Barkley I think is going to be a big time player you know and uh, I, I think he's doing great what I'd like to see was the mix of long drives. We had an 80-yard drive, a 90-yard drive, but also the splash play. We only needed one completion from Christian Hackenberg in the second half in this game, but we had plays of 30, 48, 75, 40, and 54 all in the same game. So not just the extended drives, but also exciting plays to bust long distance. All right, let's get to the Stocker Chevrolet drive of the game, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Benner Pike across from the Nittany Mall, our drive of the game. A 12-play, 80-yard journey for the Nittany Lions. Starts it out with a pass play to Chris Godwin, and Godwin's able to get to the sideline and get out of bounds very quickly to get things moving. Now, back to the ground for Penn State. They try to move it with Saquon Barkley up the middle. Now it's Akeel Lynch's turn. He gets it rolling up the middle. Pitch to the side, there goes Brandon Polk, this time not hitting anybody in the sideline. Saquon Barkley through traffic once again. These are tough yards they're picking up, and then Christian Hackenberg through the air, right down inside the five-yard line to Deshaun Hamilton. So now you're thinking inside run. Forget the inside run. They go with the reverse. DeAndre Tompkins, his first career touchdown, the Nittany Lions cap a 12-play, 80-yard drive. That is the Stocker Chevrolet drive of the game, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Bender Pike across from the Nittany Mall. Drives like that wear on defenses and grow confidence, don't they? If you think about it, you're trying to control the ball, you're trying to control the tempo of the game. You don't. The other guy does not have the ball. You're dominating them up front. I mean, it's demoralizing, and it's 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 kind of like a knockout punch. Actually, I wanted to go the other side. You're a defender on your sideline watching your offense do that. What does that do for you? Well, I think it's great. I mean, it gives the, the team so much confidence. I mean, the offense has been struggling. Uh, they struggle against Temple. I mean, clearly the offensive line has had issues this year. Um, the fact is that, you know, you've seen these guys in practice. You know how hard they work in practice in the weight room. You want to see them do well, and they perform well. And, Todd, the offensive line was the focal point after game one. 
And now we're happy to say after game three, they're the focal point again this week. Absolutely, playing a starring role. And after the games, you know, we get a chance to talk to the players, of course. And for Christian Hackenberg, there's always a big crowd around him. So I always say, all right, look, we'll get to Hack in just a few minutes. And then a funny thing happened after Rutgers, after just a couple of questions. You look over at Hackenberg, there's only a few guys, a few media members around Hackenberg. The rest are around Brian Gaia and Brendan Mann. So the offensive line received a lot of accolades, and that's much to the delight of their teammates. Very happy for them. They've earned it. They've, the, each day they've come in and put their head down and worked and worked and worked with, their, with Coach Han um, and, and Coach Donovan. And we've relied on each other and super excited for, for the results they've had the past two weeks. The rushing numbers are flat out gaudy. 41 attempts for 330 yards. Eight yards a pop for the Lions. And it was evident right away they could dominate the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that first drive, I mean, we moved the ball right down the field. And I think we all we came off the sideline. And yeah, we didn't score, but we knew that like, if we keep executing, those four yard runs are going to pop into the 80 yarders as Quan and Akil had. You know, we have the ability on the O line, it's playing with confidence. And I think also when running backs start making people miss and break and tackles and creating big plays, it, it inspires them. Coach says Lynch and Barkley are a nice one-two punch. Against Rutgers, they both deliver knockouts. Lynch had perhaps the largest hole ever to run through for his 75-yard touchdown sprint. Barkley tore up a worn-out Scarlet Knights D with 195 yards on the ground. You ever seen such wide open space on a touchdown run before? He popped one. <laughs> well, we know what those are doing here this past week, buddy, but uh, I think we, we caught him in a good play call versus, a, uh, unfortunately, a pass defense. So we, we, we gashed him on that one. So it was a great play call, great executed of guys up front. Those two guys are, are great running backs. They're, you know, an offensive line's dream. So, you know, they do their thing, we do our thing, and it works out. That's an understatement. It certainly did work out. Steve, how about that press box view of the 75-yard touchdown yeah. run? What was going on? <laughs> Where was the defense? Unbelievable. <laughs> Jack just said, whoa, that's wide open. <laughs> that's what he said. I mean, this is when the play starts. <laughs> he said, whoa, that's wide open. Offensive lines are family clothesline offensive players of the week. <laughs> Why not? Those guys did a tremendous job up front, and the offensive line, you can just see again, just the highlight packages. They, Hey, you're going to see guys finishing runs here, but it's the offensive line with the blocks. Look at Mangiro and the kickout block there. You know, a center that can pull is a great luxury without question. And look how wide open that hole is. <laughs> Unbelievable how wide open that Alyssa hole is. could have scored on that play. Let's not, let's not get carried away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> seem to, no, that's, I mean, certain analogies. All right, Barkley and Lynch, let's take a look at the numbers that they had in the last game. The big part to me is the yards per carry there. That, that's the big part in this. And for Akeel Lynch, he talked about some of the similarities between himself and Saquon Barkley. We're in very similar styles. Saquon's big and strong, big and strong fast. I think I'm the same way too. And uh, we just got to just, I think it's good to have two elite backs in that situation because when one gets tired, you can throw another one in and he can break one for 70. You see Saquon almost broke it. Uh, and we have guys outside that if we can get away from a raining game, we can show their ability as well too. So to have multiple playmakers on the field keeps the defense guessing and keeps our offense uh, explosive. So now you're going to ask about the passing game. Let's look at Christian Hackenberg's numbers from the game for Penn State as to what he did and what he's done so far this year compared to the start of last year. It's different, obviously, at this point. So for James Franklin, what about getting the passing game in gear? Uh, we're moving the pocket. We're, we're doing quick game. We're not taking a whole lot of you know, shots down the field where we have to hold on to the ball for a long period of time. Um, it, you know, it's what I've been mentioning in the last couple of weeks. It's going to evolve. We've shown that we've been able to do those things in the past. Um, we got the wide receivers to do it. We got the tight ends to do it. Um, you know, it's 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 going to be a gradual thing that we're going to allow it to to grow over time. Well, because Trey Bowers here, we're contractually obligated to talk about defense. We'll do that next up with White Tailgate.
Gave up fewer than 300 yards, gave up just three points. The beat goes on for the Penn State defense. Trey, what did you like? Uh, I like the fact that they were really aggressive. Um, they were flying to the football. They all, they looked like they were in really good position. You never really saw any of the guys get out of position, um, and that's really important to be a good defense going forward. Family clothesline, defensive player of the week, Chris Gula, but also in combination with Austin Johnson. We'll talk about the two of them as we go through here. I mean, Todd Gula did a great job in this game. Yeah, absolutely. Really flipped the field position well. And, you know, we talked about Coach Franklin, like how the offense managed the game well. I thought the defense did the very same thing, and that's because of Chris Gula. He allowed them to have a long field to work with. So Rutgers, you know, they actually had more time of possession in this game. You wouldn't think that was the case. But the defense managed the game well. They kept them out of the end zone. They did bend at times, but they never broke. And anytime you keep a Big Ten opponent out of the end zone the entire four quarters, you've done a nice job. Average drive start for Rutgers in this game, their own 18-yard line. Field position, so important. Great to walk out there, Trey, with, with an average of 82 behind you, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fact is that it, it's such a key component to, get to a game, and then as you move up the food chain with the opponents that they're going to play, I mean, field position is, is going to be key going forward. And we talked about last week as one of the keys. We didn't think in the middle of the Rutgers line they could handle Austin Johnson. We said that on the show last week, and A.J. did his job. I have a feeling that's what we're going to be saying about yeah. most teams that they come up against. <laughs> yes. They're not going to be able to handle Austin Johnson, spending plenty of time in the opponent's backfield. And him and Zettel up front, boy, they are the keys to applying that pressure right away. You know, Rutgers was supposed to run the ball pretty well, only 43 rushing yards. Yeah. They came into this game with a good offensive line, with a good running back, a couple of good running backs. Robert Martin from Harrisburg got the ball a couple of times could barely get away from the first line of defense. So they did a tremendous job stopping the Scarlet Knights running game. And for Chris Gula, a real confidence boost for him to get back in there and perform the way he did. I mean, it really is just, um, it's, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but it's kind of like a confidence boost for us because we, we consider Rutgers, um, we consider them a great team. We think obviously they have some incredible special teams and if we could hold them, we really, uh, kind of feel confident going into the rest of the games. I think this was a good uh, first game, but there's still a lot of work to be done. A special teams challenge of the season that was coming up this week. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll get to the linebackers now because Brandon Bell got back. That was a big plus for him. He discussed his return and getting back into the swing of things. Yeah, it's always good to get our depth back. And uh, I was just glad to be out there. Glad, glad Grant got a chance to be back out there. And I think, you know, we're all starting to gel a little better. And you saw that, Trey. That's you know he plays a tough spot. That field linebacker in Bob Shoot's defense is a tough spot to play. He plays it instinctively. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a really good player. He's certainly a, a physical guy. Um, there's a lot of responsibility put on his shoulders playing that position. Um, you know, you've got the legacy of linebacker. You, uh, I, I thought he did great. Yeah, the hit of the week. This time, Andrew Callista kept it within the field of play. It <laughs> happened in the second half of the game. And watch this play. Laviano is going to throw this against Penn State's dime look. And there is Troy Apke. Closing speed, creates the fumble. John Reed, second takeaway of the game to go with the interception he had earlier. You, Todd, you got to love the close here. Yeah, and you can see Apke at the beginning of the play, just in the right side of the frame, backing up, reading the play, and he just reacts quickly, knocks it, jars it loose. Reed's right there to pick it up. That guy might have a nose for the football, John Reed, in his, in his Penn State and, career. Yeah, exactly. And Trey, that's what you need to do. You need to see it, believe it. If you believe it, you're able to attack it. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that, you know, you're going to get more and more experience as you're out on the field. Um, the fact is you got to play 100%. you got to play it fast. Um, you know, like Joe used to say, it's like he, he didn't mind mistakes being made if you did it 100% and you did it full speed. You know, and the fact is that uh, after you really put a – Hit on that guy. When Maxwell Smith, the quarterback for San Diego State, has been pressured this year, he's, com he's completed only 25% of his passes. Grant Haley says that'll be a key aspect in this game. Yeah, I think our, our defensive line, you know, they're one of the best in the country. Um, and our linebackers really stepping up right now and really getting that pressure on. And that makes it that makes it easier for the secondary, you know. The quarterback, especially the young quarterback, he won't have as much time to really go through his progressions and everything. So our defensive line, I mean, that helps us out so much uh, when we give a lot of credit to them. San Diego State can run the football, and they've got one of the better running backs we're going to see in Donnell Pumphrey. A lot of people don't know about him because it's San Diego State, but he's good, really good. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, I mean, and that's where they'll have to control this thing, controlling him. And they'll line him up in the slot, too. I mean, they, they'll get the ball to him a variety of ways. Well, versatility. You know, yeah. the, when you got your best player on the field, you want to get the ball in his hands. And that will, they're going to have to be creative to get him the ball because running it straight at Penn State's defensive line is not going to work. And that's not their style anyway. They're going to swing him out. They're going to get him a little bit of open space to get him some momentum to try and utilize him to utilize his talents. All right, all of us are now going to take a trip to the classroom. Andrew Callista is going to sit down with Jay Paterno. Time to go to the ball. Look at the film and education next here on Blue White Tailgate. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Time to go inside the film room with Coach Jay Paterno. Coach, we welcome you back to the show, and you know what? We're enjoying doing this. Hope you're having fun. I'm having a lot of fun with it. All right, we're going to break down San Diego State Aztecs because we on the East Coast, we really don't know too much about them, but Jay's got us covered right here, and their personnel sets. I mean, they just have a ton of sets. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's really interesting about them is how multiple they are with their formation groups. Uh, you know, and it's to get their guys really uh, get them the ball. Pumphrey, their running back, who's just a phenomenal player, they're going to try and give them the ball a lot of different ways. Um, last year, there's a, he's a guy that had over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, over 1,800 yards rushing, uh, very involved in the pass game. So they've had a challenge. You know, he's gone from 6.8 yards a carry last year. He's under four this year. People are starting to key in on him. And so they've gone to a lot of different things to try and get him the ball. Their base set is a 21 personnel well, set. It should be noted. He is climbing the ranks of the all-time leading rushers at San Diego State. But this base set, as we take a look at it on the first slide, 21, I know what it means. Explain it for the guys at home. Well, what 21 means is that you have two backs and one tight end. On any given play, you've got five skill guys in the game. So you'll see guys, defense coordinators, people on the sidelines hold up signs that say 21. That's to let everybody on the field know that there's two backs, one tight end. And, Andrew, you know, I know you're a good student. If there's five skill guys and there's two backs and one tight end, how many wide outs they leave us? Well, I think we got about two, right? Yeah, exactly. There we go. So the base set that you get out of most people with a 21 set is really like the old I formation. The B back is the fullback, A back is your tailback, the Y is your tight end, and you've got two wide receivers. So they, they like to get in this set. Now, when you are studying them as, as a defensive player, you look at the set and you say, okay, they were in this 13 plays last week, and almost all of them were runs. And that's what those guys are going to key in on. Now we go to the next slide. Okay, next slide now, you see the wide outs are across the formation now. Now you've got a twin set. Again, same personnel, but a little different look for the defense. The defense has got to now make an adjustment to where the wideouts, but again, their tailback Pumphrey is still in the eye. Go to the next set, the next slide for us. Now they're going to change things up on this next slide, and now you're in a one-back set now. Now they've taken Pumphrey and put him in a slot. You can see with that circle right there, and now last week there were four passes, no runs in this set, so you know it's a pass-heavy set, but not only that, they got the, the, the tailback out here involved in three of the four passes, and as we take a look at the video, you'll see a slant pattern that they throw to the slot receiver against Cal last week, which was effective for him. They also threw a quick out to him a couple times and got some yards, and it's a good way to get those guys involved. Now we go to the next slide. We're going to see their bunch set, and they do their bunch set two different ways. They do it with Pumphrey here in the slot, in the third receiver in the bunch, and we'll get to the next one. But again, three plays here, three passes. They got the ball to tailback in the flat on this one. Go to the next set slide, and we'll see now, instead of the tailback being up here, now you've got the fullback and the tailback, more of a traditional uh, bunch set, where now your tailback's your run guy. Again, last week, three plays, three runs, all of them runs. Exactly opposite of where they are. So defensive guys have got to know who's where and where they're going. Then we go to the last one, and it's a trip set on our next slide. And again, this is another way to get their receiver into the slot. Again, now it's a tailback in the slot. They did this against Cal. And as we go to the video, you see it was successful for him. But they motioned him out of the backfield, took him on a corner route, which opened the tight end up underneath, or down the middle for the touchdown against Cal that got him to score early in their first drive. The fans on Saturday watched for the Aztecs tailbacks to line up a bunch of different places, a little bit like where's Waldo. Yeah, definitely, as you see the A-back flip in between all over the field, he's definitely the key guy that Rocky Long wants to get the ball. Now, we bring in Rocky, I mentioned Rocky Long. Let's go to the Aztec defense as we take a look at the first slide of what they're going to bring in to Beaver Stadium on the defensive side of the ball. Now, a little different set. Most teams you're going to play are going to have 
four defensive backs in the games on most play. But if you look at uh, San Diego State, they've got two corners, two what they call warriors, and then a free safety, two linebackers, three down, excuse me, three linebackers, and three down guys. So it's a little different scheme. Now, it gives them a lot of flexibility to blitz and do other things, and they're very, very aggressive with it. When you look also here, and there's base two deep defense, this safety is deeper, so it's tougher for the offensive line to account for him. He's going to be dropped down here, where now, where Penn State's had a lot of success running the ball inside, he's going to be in position there to make some plays. So it's going to be a very, very good challenge for Penn State. Now, as we take a look at our uh, last week against Cal, 61 plays, 35 blitzes, well over 50%, which is a huge number. But this, this set, this scheme gives them a lot of flexibility to blitz people, which brings us to our first slide where we're going to talk about the blitzes, some of the things that you may see here. Now, the blitz that you're going to see here is just an inside zone blitz. It's something, again, that, that uh, will be effective against Penn State's run game, they hope. They'll play man-to-man -man on the outside. They have very, very good corners. And then they, they freeze these safeties to come up and play the run. We'll take a look at the video of this, and you'll see how this works. You see they walk the guys up. Here comes the inside blitz. They slant towards the side of the run. Those safeties are there in position to make those plays. The thing about San Diego State is every one of their guys in the secondary will blitz at some point. Not necessarily in the game, but they are very, very aggressive. Talking about their, also talking about their secondary, number seven, their corner of the field to the right. The offense's right is very, very good as well. We go to the next slide. Just want to show you very quickly a shot of him. He's up here in the field, very aggressive in the pass game, a very, very good tackler. As we go to the video, you'll see they're going to blitz this corner off the edge. But up top, you're going to see that, that corner drop back and come up and make a very, very good tackle on a big, big guy. Most corners, when they see a guy coming out and that's that is that big, are backing off. Here you're going to see he comes up, puts his nose in there, isn't afraid. Going to be a lot of challenges for Penn State this weekend in terms of scheme, knowing where people are when Penn State's on defense and knowing where people are coming from when they're on offense. All right, you heard it from the coach right there. San Diego State bringing a lot of athletes on the defensive side of the ball and out of the running back position in the Beaver Stadium. We'll get it back to Steve, Trey, and Todd to continue to break it down on the Blue White Tailgate Show. the 129th year of Penn State football. This is the 155th different opponents. The first time they've ever played San Diego State. They come in led by head coach Rocky Long, who at one point in New Mexico was the Mountain, uh, Mountain West Conference Coach of the Year. Let's take a look at his resume as to what he's been able to put together during the course of his career. Fifth season at San Diego State. Uh, should be pointed out, they've gone to five straight bowl games. He's led them to four. And he's also not just the head coach, he is the defensive coordinator as well, which gets to us a different scheme, a 3-3-5 scheme, Trey. Well, I mean, it's just, it's a very unorthodox look. I mean, the way that I would think about it is that means what you're telling me is that you don't have enough big guys up front. You're basically going to have three down linemen. You're going to have five you know, defensive backs, and they're going to be like hybrid linebacker kind of corner guys. So, I mean, to me, that just says, okay, we're going to take the ball and run it down their throat. You know, we talked about running games translate and they travel well. I don't know about a 3-3-5 traveling to the east. I mean, maybe it's set up for the west coast and all the gunslinging they do out there, but coming off a team, a game where we've rushed for over 300 yards, you're bringing 3-3-5 three, three, to Beaver Stadium. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how that and they have works. faced, by the way, nothing but spread offenses in their first three games. So that's what they've seen so far. Secondary, not bad. Demonte KZ already has three interceptions this year, although I think all of them were in the University of San Diego game. But still, I know James Franklin likes the corners, Whitaker and KZ, a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, again, it's like you have to kind of manage your expectations. I mean, they played South Alabama, they played an FCS school, and they played San Diego. It's like, okay, well, you're playing Penn State, you're playing in front of 100,000 people, and you've got a very physical team. I mean, they're going to have their hands full. And their secondary better be good if you're going to have five of them yeah. out there, and yeah. especially their leader, because you're asking them to do a lot more responsibility than just a regular safety or a regular cornerback. You're, you're really putting a lot of heat yes. on your own secondary. 
Yeah, Jake Felly had to miss all of last year with an ACL. Then he had to miss last week's game. There was a minor car accident. He had to sit out. He's been cleared. He'll play. Calvin Munson's a really good linebacker, guys. Can play both. I mean, good depth on drops. Plays the run well. I mean, he's a big-time player, and so is Hayward the nose tackle from USC. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they San Diego State has some good players. I just don't think that they have enough of them when you're competing against a school like Penn State and the, the amount of talent that Penn State that we have. Uh, I think it's going to be a long afternoon for them. The running game on offense, this is the key. It comes down to Donnell Pumphrey, 19, 20 Rashad Penny, Chase Price, 22. 19, 20, 22. They can run the football, and Pumphrey is one of the better backs that nobody knows about, but we'll find out firsthand on Saturday. Well, and they better get these guys on the edges, because we talked about up the middle. It's not going to work out real well if you're going to try and power through Penn State's defensive line. So if they're successful swinging out Pumphrey and getting the balls out to, you know, whether it's sweeps, whether it's, you know, in the flat, they like to go to their running backs. They like to get the ball in their hands. So get some momentum so they can get around those edges if they're going to have any success against the Nittany Lions. Well, let's take a look at the numbers as to what Donnell Pumphrey and that running game they're able to put together. Look where he is career-wise. Look at the names on there. Ronnie Hellman, Marshall Falk. He's fourth all-time in rushing. Here's the other interesting part, too, guys. Their wide receivers this year only have 43 yards after the catch in three games. But the running backs, aforementioned, have 111 after the catch. So when they get them engaged in the pass game, they're the ones that make guys miss. I mean, so, I mean, that's a key part. Penn State's got to do a good job on the three of them in the pass game. Yeah. I mean, I, I think – I just really think that Penn State's – guys up front their their front six is going to create a lot of problems for them I mean they can they can say that they want to do things yeah. or they like to do things well what you think you're going to do and what you're actually going to do certainly against Penn State uh, is going to be interesting well and it's a good test for the linebackers Trey for yeah, Penn yes. State's linebackers mm -hmm. they like to get the ball in the running backs hands that's a linebacker's responsibility to get out there yes. and, and get on it yes Grant Haley meanwhile has a lot of respect for what Danelle Pumphrey can bring to the table we know what he can do. Uh, he clearly showed it last year. So we're gonna we're focused on him. We're focused on um, different running backs as well because they've had some success this year. Um, one who plays in the slot as well. So we're really looking forward to that battle. You know, you know we love to try to stop the run. That's the, one of the main goals we uh, our defense tries to do. And so we're really excited for that. Quarterback Maxwell Smith, meanwhile, a transfer from Kentucky where he started seven games there. He's off to a slow start. In fact, they freely admit this is not going along as quickly as they thought it would, but this stadium won't awe him. He's been in SEC stadiums. Yeah, well, he may not have to look around the crowd that awes him. It's the defense that he's going to have to worry about. He's only 31 of 66 so far this year. If you want to get the ball to the hands of your running back, you need to be accurate and under 50% Throwing percentage is not going to get it done, especially against Penn State. I mean, look, we, we dissect this matchup. It doesn't look good for San Diego State just the way that they set up their formations and the way they attack. And I don't know. We'll see how it plays out on the field. Well, something giveaway takeaway may be very important in a game like this. If Penn State wins that battle, they're in good shape. Back in more after this. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Pleased to welcome in a good friend of the show from Chicago, Coach Jerry DiNardo. Coach, thanks for joining us. Glad to be with you, Andrew. Thank you. Hey, Coach, after week one, Penn State fans were up in arms. They were so distraught over the Temple game. Now with the win over Rutgers, they're up in arms completely opposite because they thought it was such a great win. Your impressions early on about Penn State? <laughs> well, first of all, Andrew, my experience is, is that it's somewhere in the middle of those two games. Um, well, I thought that Penn State's season was going to be based on the performance of their offensive line. I, everywhere else they can compete. Uh, I think ultimately they'll have a championship-level talent with James Franklin recruiting, and I still think it's that way. You know, the Temple was an exaggeration. Maybe last week was an exaggeration. So it's probably somewhere in the middle, but I still think the facts are that the team's going to go as the offensive line goes. Coach, specifically talking about the offensive line, pretty much everyone back from last year, with the exception of Miles Diffenbach and Donovan Smith, what have you seen from them early on? Well, I just, they, you know, they just struggle against movement at times. You know, they, they, don't, they don't move when, when the person they're blocking moves. They're obviously struggling on pass protection. 
you know, the pass protection thing, you know, I broke down those 10 sacks against Temple. They weren't all about the offensive line. Some of the receivers couldn't shake coverage. Sometimes it was uh, a hack hanging on the ball too long. So there was a combination of things. You know, I think the long and short of it is, you know, they're not an overly talented group. I mean, this isn't anything negative about these guys. They're, they're, they're working hard. They're, they're good athletes. But if you ask James Franklin – if that is what the offensive line at Penn State is going to look like in the future, athletically and performance-wise, I think he would say no. And I, I feel the same way. But you play with what you have, and that's what they're doing. Coach, I felt the same way breaking down those 10 sacks against Temple as well. Specifically talking about the receivers, though. I know the separation is kind of like a dirty word around here. What specifically are you seeing? Is it a route quality issue, or is it maybe a scheme issue? Well, I don't necessarily think it's scheme. I think, you know, obviously college football has turned into a man coverage defensive game. You know, that's only been recently since Michigan State has had so much success. So what I think we're seeing at times is we're seeing better corners than we are wide receivers. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for the offensive side of the ball to catch up to this man coverage. And, you know, some of the spread teams are running picks and they're doing different things to get some people free. But, you know, just like Nebraska trying to defend Miami, they, they just couldn't hold up in man coverage at wide receiver versus corner. So I think there's some of that. I don't necessarily think it's scheme. I think when you play in man coverage and you're running a route against man coverage, I think a lot of it comes down to skill. Quarterback, always the battling ram, battering ram when things are going wrong, but also always getting the accolades when things are going great. Christian Hackenberg, 5.3 yards per attempt this year, down almost four yards from last year. What are you seeing out of him so far? Well, you know, he, he is a guy, as we all know, with great talent. Uh, and I always say that one of the keys to Penn State's success is taking a great talent and making him one of their best players. And that necessarily hasn't happened, but again, we go back to how do you make the quarterback that has Hackenberg's style, who has great talent, one of the best players? Well, it's done in the pass game, not in the run game. And until the offensive line is solved, until they can shake coverage, you have the most talented player on the team, or one of the most talented players on the team, not being one of the best. This, this inane thought that he is a game manager, that means one of two things. He's not as talented as we think he is, or the parts around him cannot allow him to be a, a, a playmaker instead of a game manager. And so I think that's part of the issue that has to be solved. Coach, I want to ask you a little bit of a personal philosophy question here. When facing offensive line problems, would you rather have your quarterback in the shotgun or under center? Because that's a big debate here in Happy Valley. Well, if you're having trouble protecting the quarterback, you never want him in the same spot uh, more than two or three times. So the launch point is really the issue, Andrew. Where is he throwing the ball from? You can mix up under center. You can mix up shotgun. But if he's always going to be seven yards deep directly behind the center, the defense knows where he's going to be. They're going to blow him up. So whether you start him under the center and sprint him out, whether you start him under the center and bootleg him, whether you start him in the shotgun – and put them on the run, you, you just can't give the defense the idea that you can find the quarterback at the same spot most of the game. So I don't care where you start him. It's the launch point that's important, not where he begins his drop, where he ends his drop. All right, Coach, good stuff. And once again, thanks for being here. Don't tell anybody else out there at BTN, but you are my favorite guest to have on the show. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I won't tell anybody but Howard. All right, Coach, thanks a lot. When we come back, it's time to close out the Blue White Tailgate Show. You know what's great about a college football game? It's fun. It's fun. I mean, really. I mean, all those all those shots were fun. Uh, time now for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the good is is that Saturday night was fun. I mean, I, I think for the fans, they had a great time. Look, they were asked to do this. This wasn't provided to them. And to their credit, 
they all went on websites and they found what they were supposed to wear. They had fun with it. All right, so now we get to the bad. <laughs> Guess who that is? I'm not bad. <laughs> uh, I am not bad, but Brett Bielma is bad. Like, I, I don't understand why someone like him, why does he just keep his mouth shut? He just says things and it's like he gets his rear end handed to him. It puts so much pressure on his program. Stop talking and just produce on the field. That's my bad. I get the ugly, and I'm, st I'm going south, too, for the state of Alabama and the defense. Where is the defense in the state of Alabama? Ole Miss puts up 40 on Bama in Tuscaloosa, and LSU is still running over Auburn. That was an ugly performance for those two teams. You know what's amazing? Nick Saban, Kirby Smart have been praised, 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 and we hear all the time it's Nick Saban's defense, it's Kirby Smart's. Will Muschamp, he was the higher of the offseason. It's amazing what talent means. Yeah. If you don't have it, you mm -hmm. can't be that much of a genius. Talent means something. All right, let's get to our picks here. Uh, USC's at Arizona State. I know you're fully uh, invested in games such as these. I mean, <laughs> I'm fully invested in watching the Trojans get waxed. I mean, I, I, they, I think that Sarkeesian is not going to survive this season, and I think they lose on Saturday. All right, BYU and Michigan. Uh, last two weeks have been good for Michigan after the loss to Utah. They've been organized. They've played well. It's a pretty big test. Well, it's a couple games into the season, so you're starting to see Jim Harbaugh's influence on this team, very physical team. So uh, BYU's a good test for them in Ann Arbor. So we'll see if the Wolverines can pull it out. BYU's had a couple of fortunate endings, so yes. we'll, we'll see if the Wolverines can get it done. Yes, they have. All right, now Utah and Oregon. I know... You've been a major proponent of video game football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's going to be interesting to me. I, I don't think Oregon is as good as everybody th says that they are. I think Utah is really solid, and I would not be surprised if Utah beats them. The game's at Autzen Stadium, by the way. And UCLA will play at Arizona. By the way, Scooby Wright gets back this week. So that, that's good for college football. I have a good football player coming back. Jim Mora, Todd. I think essentially asked Tom Bradley, get me one more stop each half and we'll be successful. Uh, he's doing a lot more than that. Yeah, well, this is going to be a good one because you figure who's going to come out of the Pac-12. People are talking about USC and Stanford end at that talk real quickly with the victory. This is a big one, UCLA and Arizona in the Pac-12 to see who can kind of take the reins of that conference. Yeah, no, no question. And uh, UCLA is playing pretty well, although they're going to play without four defensive starters this week, and we'll find out how they, well, well they do with that. Time now for the Aaron's Keys to the Game. You're darn right we're going to talk about the Aaron's Keys to the Game. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron's. <laughs> Trey, what about your keys? Uh, I, I think the key for me is going to be can Penn State continue to play well. They've had three good halves of football now. Um, I, I would see us winning the coin toss, deferring, um, three and out the first defensive at first defensive stop um, and it's going to be key is, is to setting the tone early right. yeah I'm going to go next Steve real quick because okay, okay, I want to talk about ball security and, and Penn State is plus yeah. three in that category and they've really handled the ball well but it seems to be a trend in state college Trey help me out with this ball security in state college seems to be <laughs> quite a trend here in this area uh, Mr. Jones don't drop the ball <laughs> get your pets spayed and neutered very well done very well done. frightening, a, frightening actually. excellent public service message <laughs> yes don't drop the ball okay. quick story about that picture <laughs> I don't know if you have time okay oh no he comes in that dog he's running all over the place right they finally get a hold of them. They got two quick shots. <laughs> right. And that's all we could do. All right. My key is that I'm going to somehow get a hold of that picture and throw it out. <laughs> but it's a good message. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. 3.30 The Kick. Thanks for joining us at the Blue White Tailgate, presented by Coors Light.